Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today, I, Sunday, uh, we're continuing with our character studies. And right now, we've advanced all the way up to Joseph, uh, the son of uh, uh, Jacob Israel. And if you haven't seen uh, the previous uh, character studies, they're already uploaded on my uh, YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you go back and watch those. Uh, so far, I think we've done uh, uh, Adam and Eve, um, Satan, uh, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now we're on Joseph. We're, we're basically just studying the most prominent characters uh, in the scriptures. Uh, now, We've already t talked about Joseph's early life, his, his early dreams and prophetic dreams and how his brothers put him in the well and he was sold into slavery and, and then he uh, it was uh, in prison and then was able to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh and he was given uh, power second in command only to Pharaoh. So that's where we are right now. Uh, and I want a more thorough explanation of everything that's happened, as I said, go back to the videos that are already uploaded on my channel. Uh, right now, we're going to begin with Genesis chapter 42. First, let me ask uh, Brother Eric. Uh, we've, got a lot of, we've got a lot of background noise. All your movement around and stuff is making quite a sound there, Brother Eric. Oh, forgive me for that. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, though. I'll fix it. Yeah, introduce yourself, and then we'll get started, okay? Okay, this is... Uh, Eric, in Magic Fairy Dust Land, and uh, uh, I pray that all is well with every all the viewers and all the panelists. Yes. Back okay. to you. All right, brother. Uh, brother Bill, uh, uh, Panda Man Evangelist, uh, was on, but there's some technical problem, and he's trying to get back on with us, so hopefully... He'll get that worked out and be able to join us at some point. But for now, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to read the Amplified, I'm, I'm sorry, the King James uh, translation here, chapter 42. He says, Now when Jacob saw that there was no corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence uh, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten bro brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Uh, but Benjamin, Joseph's brother, uh, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest per peradventure mischief befall him. Uh, so uh, recap just a, a little bit here. We know that what's happened uh, so far is that uh, while Joseph was in prison he, he was completely innocent but falsely charged and uh, put in prison while he was there he interpreted dreams of, of two of the servants of Pharaoh that were in prison and, uh, and then Pharaoh had some dreams and no one could interpret them so he he was told about Joseph in prison, his ability to interpret dreams. And Joseph was called to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. And he interpreted it and said that they're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And that he needed, he told Pharaoh he needed to appoint a wise man to be put in charge of storing up a lot while they have plenty, uh, so that they have plenty uh, uh, while the seven years of, of uh, famine are going on. And Pharaoh recognized that uh, Joseph would be the right man for the job. And so he put him in charge of this project. In fact, he put him in charge of everything in Egypt. Uh, and basically, uh, he had almost the complete power of Pharaoh. And now the famine has come to be. To be uh, and people around that part of the world are all going hungry. Uh, and they know that, that in Egypt, they have plenty so they're, everybody's going to Egypt to try to buy food, buy corn. Uh, and so now 
Jacob sends his sons. He has 11 sons left. Uh, and he sends them off, uh, except for the youngest son, Benjamin. He sends them off to Egypt to go on this quest to find food and, and buy it and bring it back so that Jacob's family doesn't starve to death. I think that much of the world at, the, at that time would be starving because of the famine. So, brother, what's, what's your, um, what do you have to say about this so far? This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, I love the story of Joseph and his life and uh, all his trials and tribulations, all his uh, gifts and uh, his purpose. It's, it's a very wonderful story, a great heritage we have in Christ Jesus uh, with Joseph. Well, let, let me ask you, brother. Uh, I, I don't think you were with me when I discussed the early parts of this story about Joseph, but um, he is considered to be uh, a picture of, of Christ uh, because um, he, he was buried in that well and then came out of the well. They were going to leave him for dead, but he, he was him putting, being put in the well was like the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and then he's also likened to Christ in that he's the Savior because he's the Savior of the people because uh, they must come to him to provide their needs so they don't die from starvation. So um, there's a lot of great things that we learned from this story, but uh, this is one of the many examples we find in the scriptures of what are called shadows or pictures uh, of uh, uh, this future Savior, Jesus. Amen. And that's undeniable proof uh, to me and to our Jewish uh, brothers uh, who uh, or deny the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, one day they will see Jesus face to face, and uh, it will be just like when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. Uh, amen. That, and that is coming up next. So let's let's read on. And uh, uh, says. And Joseph, verse 6, chapter 42, verse 6, And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now, uh, do you recall his original dreams uh, when he was a young boy? Yes, I sure do. Uh, about the moon and the stars bowing down to Joseph and his wheat, all the brothers' wheat uh, stacks bowing down to Joseph's wheat stack. Of course, uh, they didn't like that very much, did they? No, they did. They were quite jealous uh, because it was, Joseph was the favorite of, of, from uh, the father, their father, uh, Jacob, Israel. I say Jacob, Israel, because uh, his name was Jacob, and God changed his name to Israel. So uh, rather than calling either Jacob or Israel, I will just call him Jacob, Israel. But uh, uh, the Jacob Israel loved this Joseph more than the others, and the others got very jealous about it. And then when he, Joseph had this dream that was prophetic, and, and they, inter they understood that dreams meant that the brothers and even the parents would, would be bowing down uh, to, uh, to Joseph someday, um, that they were quite offended by that. And, and now we see the fulfillment Right here in verse 6 is the fulfillment of that dream, that prophecy. 
So let's let's look at continue on, go to verse seven. Um, and Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Okay, so what is your, what do you think of the idea that Joseph did not immediately divulge to them who he was? Oh, I think it's wonderful. It's very dramatic, isn't it? And I just love how uh, Joseph made himself strange to them and spake roughly to them. That just, oh, that just does it for me. Can you imagine how that must have went down? Yeah, uh, I think uh, initially Joseph must have been like really surprised at this point to see his, his brothers there. And he recognized they're bowing before him. He probably put two and two together and realized that this was the fulfillment of his prophetic dream when he was a, a, a very young man. And uh, after all these years, this has come to pass. And, and he's probably surprised and shocked to, to see them, but also very, um, uh, very much probably didn't know how to react. I, I guess he could have just immediately told them, hey, I'm, I'm Joseph, your brother, but he holds this back for quite a long period of time. Uh, let me ask Brother Bill, who just joined us, just to introduce himself, and then also I want to get his uh, reaction to this question here. Brother Bill, hi. Glad you could uh, make it work. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yeah, very good. Yeah. You just can't see your yeah, face. Yeah. you got your audio. I'm on, I'm, I'm on my mobile phone, so there might be a bit of a delay. And, and But, yeah, I didn't quite get your question because I've been trying to get in for the last 10 minutes. But, you oh. know, I am the Panda Man Evangelist, and, yeah, I'm glad to join this hangout on my mobile phone for the first time. <laughs> okay, all right, brother. A couple of things that you, you, I said that you missed is that uh, uh, I, I cited in some ways that Joseph is, is a, what we call a shadow or a picture of Jesus. Uh, his life can be um, uh, in some ways compared to Jesus, uh, how he was put in that well and it's like the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and, and how he in the land of Egypt, um, he was in a position to save, save his brethren and and, uh, and all the Israelites because he had the power to give them food so they wouldn't die of starvation. So in these ways, he's compared to to Jesus. Uh, and then now we're at the point where we've got um, the fulfillment of his original dream that the wheat bowed down and the stars and everything bowed down to him when he had those first dreams and. His, uh, his brethren were very offended and jealous of him. Uh, now we see that it's fulfilled because the brothers are before him now in Egypt. This is the initial meeting in verse uh, 6, chapter 42, verse 6. And, it's, and he, he, Joseph sees his brothers bowing down to him. He must be aware that, ooh, this, this dream I had is fulfilled before me now, and yet he doesn't immediately tell them I'm Joseph, your brother. He, he he carries on for quite a while. Why do you think that he he decides to uh, play this out the way he does rather than immediately tell them, I'm Joseph, your brother? Hmm. Brother Bill, did you hear that? Do you have an answer? Yeah, yeah, just about, yeah, just about, yeah, because it, it's similar to where you know, where Jesus, you know, after he was resurrected, you know, he, he, he met uh, some of the disciples, didn't he? And he ate with them and drank with them. And straight away, he didn't tell them who he was, but they were strangely warned, weren't they? And they, and they eventually knew who he was. So, yeah, there, there is, there's an assembly there, isn't there? Not quite sure why, but there is. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you said that. I, I, I hadn't, I hadn't connected the dots on that one. That is very true, though. It's another, another similarity between uh, the life of Jesus and, and, and uh, the life of, uh, of Joseph. 
Uh, all right, let me go on. I'm going to read the next verse. Uh, it's um, verse eight, uh, verse verse nine. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed about, and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. Uh, and they said unto him, Nay, Lord, nay, my Lord, but, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all in all of one man's sons, we are true men, thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. Hmm. All right, uh, Brother Eric, what do, you, what do you have to say about those verses? Well, uh, that is why we are here to discover what made Joseph tick. And so I'll let you go ahead and uh, delve into that. All right, let me ask Brother Bill if he has some insights, insights on this. So I've just uh, I've muted myself, muted myself on on my phone, believe it or not. And I thought you could only do it on computers, but you might I've managed to do it on my phone. Can can you can you just briefly repeat that again so I can get a full grasp? Uh, yeah, I, I just read this verse about um, his uh, the way he reacted to his brothers. He not only does not tell them. He, he, it says in verse 9, he realizes that this is a fulfillment of his dream. Uh, and, but he doesn't tell them that. Instead, he accuses them of being spies, and he plays this game out that we know is coming up in this chapter here. Uh, and um, he, he accuses them of being spies, and his brothers say, no, we're not spies, we're just here to buy food, and we're all the sons of one man. And so that's what we... Uh, do you have anything insights on that? Yeah, I think he wanted, in a gentle way, to to give him a, a sense of how he felt, because you know his brothers betrayed him, and he was innocent, and you know he, he didn't do anything wrong, but you know they soon you know beat him up, chopped him in a hole, and sold him into slavery, and I think he wanted them to to feel what, what it's like to be innocent of something, yet get charged of it. So he wanted them to have a little bit of empathy there. Because we know he never went through with it and, you know, eventually did reveal himself to him. But I, that's what I think. He wanted them to see how horrible it is that the innocent people are, are, are accused of doing wrong when they've done nothing wrong. That's what I believe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you've already given me a couple of in insights that I, I didn't uh, really see before, so thank you. Um, it brings me to uh, the question of being tr um, falsely accused. Um, we know how Joseph reacted to it, you know. Um, he, he was uh, mistreated by his brothers, but he didn't, uh, he didn't end up hating them. He was, he was uh, uh, sold into slavery, and he, he seemed to thrive in it. God still blessed him, and he didn't uh, get angry or bitter over it. And then he was falsely accused of uh, sexual assault by Potiphar's wife, and he, he didn't get like angry and, and uh, resentful. He just went on and kept serving the Lord, and the Lord kept blessing him, everything he did. And, 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 and uh, so that's how he reacted to it. And uh, that's an example for all of us. Uh, but now his brothers are going to get a taste of being falsely accused and <laughs> see how they react. Now, I know in my life, there's been a couple of times where people totally made up false accusations against me in my life, and it's, I've always found that to be a, a, a horrible, horrible um, thing to deal with um, because it, you're, you're kind of in a real helpless, helpless uh, you, know, you, you can't seem to prove uh, that you you did not do something. I mean, if you don't have any proof, you, there's no way of uh, having witnesses. It's just someone saying something false about you, and you're, there's no one, nothing you can do except deny it. And then you never know if people are going to believe you or not, or 
even if they say you believe you, that they may have you may wonder if they really do believe you or if they they doubt your your claims of innocence. So have you guys ever had to deal with anything like this? Yeah, I've had to I've had to deal with a lot of that. I mean I mean a lot of that. But you know, count it all joy when we go through all these diverse temptations and sufferings, because you know we're obviously doing suffering right. You know, when, when the the accuser of the brethren starts stirring up lies and malice, you know you're doing something right. And and and, and the same, you know, with, with with Christ, you know, the accuser, you know, you know, obviously shot yourself in the foot because he he landed up falling straight into God's plan by getting Christ crucified, but. You know, there's making accusations and, and stirring up trouble about Christ, and the same is, you know, true for for, for poor old, you know, Joseph here. But yeah, I, I think it's it's generally a mark. Not always, you know. I'm, I'm out on the limb here. I really do think it's generally a mark that that you know the saints are doing something right when, when accusation is railed at them all the time. Yeah. Uh, well. My mother had a saying. Uh, more, my mother had. She didn't have a lot of biblical sayings, but she did have some wise words. I've cited some of them in previous videos. But one of the things she said is that misery loves company. <laughs> and uh, in, in a way, it is comforting to know that okay, brother Bill, you you experienced the same kind of. Um, thing that I've just explained that, I, that I've suffered from and, and we see Joseph and now he's putting his brothers through this false accusation and uh, it is kind of comforting I think to know that hey I'm not the only one a lot, a lot of people are, have to ex experience this kind of thing and it's a uh, it, it's great learning experience uh, it's not pleasant but you learn a lot from it brother, brother Eric what's, what's your comment on this Uh, it seems to be common for uh, all of us to uh, experience these uh, same type of betrayals. Uh, I've experienced mine own, and uh, I would like to share them with you all uh, in private uh, sometime. Uh, but it's okay. Whatever we go through... For the sake of Jesus Christ and the gospel, it's okay. Okay, amen. I'm going to move on to the next verse now. Um, it's, um, okay, Genesis 42, verse, um, uh, verse 13. Uh, and they said, Thy servants are twelve. Twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one, one is not. Well, that's interesting. Um, let me ask Brother Bill, what's your reaction to verse 13? Yeah, yeah, verse 13, it, it's, it's as if that, yeah, their conscience is suddenly drawn out of them. You know, they've suddenly realized that, you know, they've been accused of something, and, and they've obviously realized how bad it is, and their conscience has been drawn. Because they're admitting now that, obviously, that the younger one, but obviously not the pre-younger one, who was Joseph. So they're admitting there is, in a way, there was another one. And they don't know where he is. You know, they obviously haven't come full out and said they betrayed him yet. But you, know, you, you can see that conscience working slowly, in, just in that verse. You know, and it says, and they said, the servants of twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is this day of our father, and one is not. So they're talking about obviously Joseph there. You know, they didn't have to say this, but their conscience is, is playing on them. I believe at this moment. Yeah, it's, it's, it really stood out to me as I read that verse that they, they said there's 12 of them. And um, and then they elaborate further about the two that are missing. One is left at home and one is not. 
uh, that is either means he's dead or, or they. I don't think. I, I think they probably assume that he, he died or they sold him into slavery, so they don't really know what became of it. Uh, but uh, it shows to me that uh, he is still remembered and uh, acknowledged. They're not like saying that there's only 11 of them, They're, like pretending that or, like he never existed. And it must, it must really uh, touch Joseph's heart at this time to, to see that they, they are acknowledging this, this lost brother that is, uh, uh, that is not. They, they haven't like totally forgotten about him or like tried to wipe him from their memory. Brother Eric? Well, um, that's interesting. Uh, I will hear more of it. Okay, brother, do anything more on verse 13 before we move on? Okay. All right, I'm going to verse 14. And Joseph said unto them, uh, that, is, that is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him catch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison. That, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into, into ward of three days. Into ward, I don't know, I guess ward is uh, like jail. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And, and they did so. Okay. Brother Bill, are you back with us now? Yeah, I am back. Yeah, you've just broken up a bit. But yeah, yeah, I, I can hear just about. Just about, but yeah, he's, he's, you know, and we're going to see further on later on in this this chapter as well. He's now he's putting them in a similar scenario because they're they're going to have to bring the other younger brother, the new younger brother, you know, to and they're going to they're going to have to hold him and they're going to panic. And I think you know, but we we see it all pan out later on. Why Joseph? Because what I think Joseph was doing is very wise. Because he really stirs our conscience and gets to the point where later on they're, they're you know they're in dread of, of fear of losing the you know the youngest brother you know and it all plays out fantastically you know. Well, I'm wondering why um, uh, I have an idea, but I'm not sure I'm right. Why he wants the younger brother to come there? Anybody have a, a guess why? Well, only that he used to be the youngest brother, and you know, I believe that they want him to again, so their conscience can be pricked to 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 see what it's like, you know, <laughs> because obviously the father suffers mostly through this, but that they want him to. Joseph wants the brothers to understand what it is like to, to, to lose a younger brother which they already lost. Yeah, you know, first time they didn't care. You know, there's envious and jealous and stuff like that, but you know, time has moved on and, and they've obviously been guilt ridden over what they've done. So now Joseph is saying, Roy, you know, hand your your youngest brother over to me. So I think he's he's playing a very clever, you know, psychological game there. This is what I see what going on. Yeah. Well, do you remember his original uh, dream about the wheat bowing over? Uh, I guess, I think there were 11, 11 um, 
what do they call them? Uh, stalks of wheat, or not stalks, but uh, bundles, 11 bundles of wheat that bow. And uh, at this point, there's only 10 bowing. And uh, for the, the prophecy really to be fulfilled, I mean, there has to be the other brother there, uh, because the prophecy was that there were all of them bowing to him. So I, I don't know if he's doing it to intentionally fulfill the prophecy or by him wanting the younger brother there, it, it, that does, in effect, uh, it was what he saw in his prophecy. He saw the future. Okay, I'll go on to uh, the, the next verse. Um, well, what about this three days? <coughs> um, it says in verse 17 and 18, and he put them all together in, into Lord three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, <coughs> this do and live, for I fear God. Do you think I might be uh, trying too hard uh, here with the, with the three day uh, question? Because <coughs> we're talking about all of this being a foreshadow or a picture of Jesus in the future. And here we know that Jesus was in that tomb for three days. Do you have a, any idea on that, Brother Eric? But Bill, I guess, lost the connection or something. He's going to try to get back, I hope. Brother Eric? Uh, you're absolutely correct. Once again, and that is why uh, I have appointed you to my... Uh, Chiefest counsel. And uh, I love the story of Joseph. Uh, I uh, consider it should be a mandatory uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, everyone should hear, uh, know the story of Joseph. All young men, uh, they should watch the Prince of Egypt. That's a great uh, video. I love it. Yeah. Where can they get the, the Prince of Egypt? Is that a DVD or is it on YouTube or what? Um, yeah, it's on DVD. Uh, you could probably pick it up anywhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll move on to the next verse now. Um, uh, these are... Uh, verse 21, and they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when we, he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore, is this distress come upon us? And Reuben answers them saying, spake I not unto you saying, do not sin against the child and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Also. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And, and he turned himself about from them and wept, returned to them again and communed with them, and took from them Simeon and bowed him before their eyes. Wow. That's a pretty, pretty dramatic uh, scene that just happened there, huh? Uh, how they're 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 bleeding. Oh, oh, okay, brother Bill. Well, now we're we're at the point now where the brothers are speaking in their own language and saying that uh, the reason this bad thing's happening to them is because of what they did to uh, to the, the other brother uh, in the past. How they they should never have done it, and, and uh, they're being reminded by Reuben that uh, uh, they're they're all guilty, and uh, and then Joseph under, understands them. Uh, they don't realize that he understands his their language because he's using an interpreter. But he understands what they're saying and realizes that they have really uh, regret and, and uh, what they did to Joseph, and and he turns away and weeps and then comes back. So uh, that's pretty uh, quite a uh, poignant, uh, very poignant uh, scene that's taking place there. That's, uh, that's verses uh, 
uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, verses 21, 2, and 3. Are we looking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What I was going to pick up, I don't, I don't mean to go back a little bit, but it suddenly dawned to me that, you know, they was put in the prison for, for three days. It just suddenly dawned to me that, that, that Christ was, you know, you know, three days in the belly of the earth. You know, I just thought that was interesting in the prison, and then obviously, yeah, just interesting. Well, let me let me tell you that while you were disconnected for a couple of minutes, that's what I brought up as, as interesting. I wanted to, I was asking for your comment on it, and you were gone. So, so oh, 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 really? <laughs> interesting that 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 really stood out, like, yeah. you know, glaring to me and to you both. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing that, amazing. So there's, there's obviously a lot, <clears throat> a lot of significance there, a lot of significance. You know. What do you what do you make of this scene where they are really repenting and you can see that there's uh, there's uh, I think it's way beyond uh, feeling that bad about what's happening to them, being falsely accused and and the situation that they're under with uh, uh, having to have. Simeon left behind, and they got to go and bring back uh, Benjamin. Okay, that's that's a thing that they they wish wasn't happening. But are they are they contrite because they they they're suffering the consequences of their actions, or are they contrite because they really feel bad about it? they they realize they really were unjust and, okay. and mistreated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think personally a little bit of both, but mostly you can see because they, you know, they did mention earlier on about this brother that, that they obviously don't know where he is and what happened to him. So you can see an underlying genuine, you know, remorse for what they've done. So it's obviously stirred on our conscience since they've done it. And I think, you know, what with how, like I said, Joseph plans this out brilliantly. You know, he's drawing out. And, and, and touching on, uh, you know, and convicting them and, and stuff in such a manner that, that you know, he's drawn it out of them. You know, a lot of poison being drawn out of, you know, a wound, and that is what he's doing. He's drawn out, you know, what is their actual heart conviction in this manner. And, and I think he's, he, he's getting really, really close to the point, as we see later on in it. You know, it's one of my favourite, actually, one of my favourite chapters in Genesis. So I really, you know, I thought because of the way Joseph obviously led by God to do this, does it. And, and it gets straight to the heart of the matter. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the more that we discuss this, the more I'm convinced that, that this is, uh, it is serving that purpose to draw out these feelings and memories uh, from the, the brothers. And maybe that's what has to happen before he can completely embrace them again and, and, and accept them back. Um, even though he's willing to give them food and, and, and you know, so they don't starve, but to accept them back as his brothers, and stuff, you know, maybe this is kind of a cathartic experience that they have to go through to, uh, to uh, repent and, and uh, realize that they've uh, uh, really regret the fact of what they did to Joseph. Are there Eric, any comments on that? Well, it's just uh, like you and Bill were saying, it's one of the greatest stories in the Bible, one of my favorites as well, and uh, just can't get enough of it. Uh, there's a lot to be learned there, and uh, we're only touching the surface just as, as of yet. All right, then I'm gonna I'm gonna go on um, in the next verses. Uh, uh, verse 25. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn, and to restore every man's money into his sack, and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them, and they laded their asses with corn. And departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, 
he espied his money, for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. And he said unto his brother, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? <laughs> Okay, Brother Bill, the money that they paid for this corn, uh, they paid it, and yet they got it back. And uh, the, the, their reaction is fear. Why, why, why would they be afraid? Well, well they're afraid because obviously they've just been accused of nicking money, which they've denied and denied and denied. And then in the sack, they've got their money. That they were supposed to buy. So it's like I said, it's Joseph's game playing out brilliantly. Like I said, you really have to read the whole thing in one hit, don't you, to, to see the beauty of it. So it's hard to express with them couple of verses what's going on. But we've read the whole thing. We know what's going on, and it's just just brilliantly done. You know, you know, Joseph is really playing it with a T. <clears throat> They, uh, they, I think they're, they're very much aware that they've already been accused of being spies. And now they can see that, wait a second, now we're going to be accused of, of stealing this and not paying for it. And so they're, uh, they must be very fearful that, you know, what's going to happen. Uh, and when they get back home, obviously, they're safe, but they realize that you know that a certain amount of corn is not going to solve their problem. They're going to have to go back over and over again to uh, to continue getting corn, and you know, plus they have to go back in order to get um, Simeon back, and they have to bring they have to bring uh, Benjamin before uh, Joseph. So they're they're just looking ahead and saying, "Wait a second! Now we're going to, now when we come back." will be accused of, of stealing because the money we paid for it is we still have it. So I think that they're in fear of anticipation of what's going to happen when they come back. Okay, let's Brother Luke. Yes. Uh, I just thought of something. Mm -hmm. Are we too in fear that Christ will reveal himself to the Jewish people in the middle of, uh, after a, a four-year bad, uh, four-year good years, and then uh, at the beginning of uh, four bad years. Did we have not covered the, the, that part, that dream? You know what I'm talking about? Um, the, the, the good and the bad years were seven. They had seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And uh, so uh, I, if you're looking at like end times eschatology here for a moment, then uh, I can see how maybe somebody might connect the seven years to what many people think is a seven-year tribulation period. But uh, I'm no longer in that camp on, on the, the tribulation. Uh, but for those people who think there is a future seven-year tribulation, I can see how that maybe they, since this is also seven years, they may draw some kind of uh, comparison to it, if that's what you're saying. Is that, is that what you're alluding to? Uh, yes, I'm referring to uh, specifically Jonathan Kahn's prophecy, and uh, according to him, I believe uh, we just ended the good seven years, and uh, the next uh, seven years will be the bad seven years, and... Uh, if he's correct, then uh, Christ will be revealed to the Jewish people uh, in the immediate future. Of course, uh, it's all speculative and uh, writing on your, your all's approval. You was mute. You was mute. You was muted all the way through that, <laughs> Luke. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Probably, 
probably it was better than I was muted anyway. <laughs> um, I don't know what content is, um, but uh, Brother Bill made a comment in the private chat area uh, saying that Jonathan is a, is a heretic. And so uh, Brother Bill would have to speak to that, why he doesn't uh, have confidence in uh, his, uh, his interpretation of scriptures. But uh, as I said, to me, uh, I no longer am in the camp of a future literal seven-year tribulation. Uh, after re-studying uh, end times from every different viewpoint, I've come to other conclusions, and that's that's in other many of my other videos. I've I've told what I think about that, but uh, so I, I don't really I don't buy the connection there. But I can see how some people would would. Uh, use the seven years of, of plenty and seven years of famine and then also say that well there's seven years of tribulation even though really I don't know if you realize this but uh, nowhere in the scripture said it doesn't say there's a seven year tribulation it doesn't say that in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel they try to make the last week the 70th week of Daniel to be the seven years of uh, tribulation but uh, it's it, to me it's, it's, it's really uh, an attempt to try to make things fit that don't really fit together correctly. Um, Brother Bill, what's your comment on all this? Well, you know, like I said, Revelation, it talks about 1,260 days. It doesn't say seven years because that would double that. So, and, and a lot of it, the, you know, the problem with, and this is why there's so many heresies abound and so much confusion with Revelation, is because a lot of it is, is pictorial, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, What's the word I'm trying to think of? It's, 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 it's not impossible to, to work out the Bible of Revelation if you you know if you're a super scientific brain, but a lot of it is is written in a manner that is still a mystery. Yeah, it's apocryphal apocryphal style of writing that uh, is uh, subject to all kinds of interpretation. It's not it's not plain spoken where you say uh, something and no one disputes what it means, but Almost yeah. everything in Revelation, uh, there's a hundred different opinions of what it means. <laughs> and a lot of it is metaphor, you see. And, and that is the problem trying to distinguish, which I always found hard, and that's why I don't bother getting into eschatology anymore, because so much of it is metaphorical, you can't distinguish what is and what isn't. You know? And some people take it literal, and, and then you've only got to say, you know, then you've got to read half the things in Revelation, you know, you know, with beasts all round, your eyes all round them and stuff like that, and you think, come on, it's not, you're not going to expect some floating beast to come down to earth with eyes all around them. This is, this is, met, this is metaphor, you know, and even we know, you know, where it talks about the, 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 uh, the man, the eagle, the lion and the ox, you know, most people would actually know in Christian now, that, that their metaphors are the four Gospels. So they're not actual four creatures that are going to float around the earth. That these are pictures and, and types of, 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 of the four Gospels. So, yeah, that's uh, an obvious metaphor. Yeah. Uh, all right, Brother, Brother Eric, uh, rather than getting off into a, a full study of eschatology, I, I would just refer you and, and, and the viewers to... Uh, uh, playlist I have called dispensationalism, uh, uh, tribulation, the millennium, and so on. I, I, I forgot the exact title for it, but uh, uh, I show that uh, my my what my viewpoints were in the past, and now why I've changed my viewpoints on that. So you, if you have interest, you feel free to go look at all that. But as I agree with Brother Bills, I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about that because uh, even though uh, I've changed my viewpoint. I'm still. I don't even feel convinced my new viewpoint is correct because it's so it's so uh, confusing, and there's so many people arguing adamantly from different on different viewpoints that everybody. Some people take it so seriously they think they've got it all figured out. But I don't think anybody. And I've studied every different viewpoint on on eschatology now, and I don't think anybody has it 100 percent right. So okay, I'd just like to add one more thing. Uh, my whole purpose uh, for bringing that drawn out uh, uh, trialogue was uh, to point out one thing, and that's uh, typically uh, 
these uh, these uh, doctrines that uh, don't adhere to Scripture, people that hold these doctrines also hold uh, a, a false gospel that cannot save, mm -hmm. as uh, Bill pointed out uh, with uh, the Rabbi Khan. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, this is my my main concern is that uh, we can spot these uh, uh, real quick when the their failed prophecies uh, happen. Uh, uh, we we they always point back most in most cases that they're preaching a false gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay, I I would say that you probably knowing Brother Bill very well. Uh, his mind's probably working away right now, uh, making a plan to do an expose on Jonathan Kahn now. Uh, he, he's done a lot of expose videos showing the uh, the heresies of these individuals. And so uh, maybe that's uh, on, the, on the drawing board for him next. We'll see. Oh, yeah, that's probably one we got. I said, my, my alarm, uh, just before we got carry on with the actual subject we're supposed to, but my, my alarm bell started ringing when, you know, he became a self-proclaimed rabbi, and everyone calls him rabbi, and rabbi this and rabbi that. You know, but even Jesus says in Matthew 23, 8, he says, you know, but, you know, be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So, you know, you can't be going around self-exalting yourself and becoming haughty and, and becoming the self-proclaimed rare boy of end-time events. That, 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 that really ought to smell a rat when that happens. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm actually very sensitive to that kind of thing, too. Uh, I take this, uh, this uh, um, uh, statement of Jesus or... or uh, um, Command, or however we're going to describe these words, where he says, "Don't call any man teacher or rabbi." And um, I also I expand that a little bit further. I uh, I notice that there's a lot of people I encounter on YouTube that self-identify as apostles, and um, and then there's people that identify as bishops. And I I don't believe in the hierarchy of of the uh, a clergy. Uh, I, I believe in the laity, which is the just the collection of all believers that we're all equal, and that uh, so we have different gifts. Some can teach, some some can preach, and, and uh, there's there's all kinds of gifts and different roles for different people within the body. But I don't like anybody exalted above another, uh, and that's why I, I continue to refer to you guys and myself as brother um, because we're all brother that makes us all equal I don't want to be put up on any kind of a pedestal called calling their on your pastor or I, I, I think that uh, the church has made a big mistake um, getting two classes of people the laity and the clergy uh, so if you want us to say anything about that before we move on to the next verse go ahead yeah, only I agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm sick of it as well. It is, it is self exaltation. You know, every other person on YouTube is a mighty apostle or a prophet of this or a warrior. You know, for crying out loud, let's be honest. We're all servants. We're all sons of God. You know, and we should be thankful as just being called a son. You don't need to be exalting yourself above measure and call yourself a, an apostle or a warrior or a prophet. You know, the apostolic age is dead. You need to get over it. You're just the son of God like me. That's enough to hit. Uh, okay, brother, so I'll, I'll move on to the next verse here. And it says, uh, verse uh, 29, And they came unto Jacob their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us, and took us for spies of the country. And we said unto him, We are true men, we are no spies. And we be twelve brethren, sons of our father, 
One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone, and bring your youngest brother unto me, and then sh shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So will I deliver you, your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. Well, okay. Well, what's your uh, response to that? Well, yeah. If you read further on, you you find out <laughs> you find out Jacob's response anyway. But yeah, it is you know that that yeah in a fearful time because you know they they they've just been accused of spies. They've come back to the land. That you know back to the father's house. And they they've got all the food they want and plus all the money. So yeah, they they really are starting to pass. But yeah, the. You have to read the whole thing to get the context there, don't you? Because I, I know what's happening. I can see what's going through their minds and their hearts, and, and, and you can see the panic running through you know, the father you know, later on at the end of the verse. But, yeah, there's certainly a concern there, and especially knowing, again, so they've admitted again there are 12, but one is not, no more, and now that you know they have to bring their youngest one you know, up, up to this, you know, who is Joseph, who they think is, you know, real high up. Because they don't know who he is yet. Well, what what kind of stands out to me here uh, is the fact that this is a real, true account of what happened. They're not lying. Now that might sound strange to say that it's it's really interesting that they're not lying. But the reason I say that is because this whole family, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, um, and, and, and the other brothers, it's just a, a whole series, and even the wives, you know, uh, uh, Sarah, Rebecca, uh, they, all they do is just lie. Uh, they lie about, the, the, this is not my wife, and they, 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 lie, they lie about, uh, uh, I'm, I'm your son, uh, and, uh, I, I am Esau, but he's not, and then they lie about what happened to Joseph. You know, he was must have been killed by a wild animal. Just one lie after another from this whole family. Uh, the only one in the family I can see here that that has no um, uh, no blame is Joseph. Uh, I haven't I haven't discovered any any fault in Joseph. Maybe you guys can give me some insight on that as we read on. Maybe I'll I'll see some. Yeah, I feel like I said it is pointing that that, that Joseph was out, out of the. The twelve, he was the blameless one, and, and his point in, in in as much as Christ was blameless, yet Christ was the one who suffered, and the same as Joseph, he was blameless in that in that sense. It wasn't perfect like Jesus, but you know, in a pictorial sense, he was blameless. Yet he was the one who suffered all the way through until obviously now. But Christ, you know, was glorified, so he suffers no more. So you know, it's, it's, there is a lot to tie in between Joseph and Christ, and, and that. That is very poignant, I believe. Yeah, that was very well said. Uh, uh, just another way that we can see that this truly is one of the many uh, examples of shadows of this um, the people and and events of, throughout the Old Testament are show, are, are illustrating us. Illustrating us about this future person who's to come, who will uh, s save us. And I have a playlist called "The Bloody Trail." I highly recommend that to everybody. But uh, what I attempted to do in that was go from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through and show all the all of the different things uh, that that we could say these are truly pictures of a future event, uh, so that. Uh, it is amazing how many there are. And here we're talking about Joseph. It's one of many that we can draw these same kinds of comparisons. It's a, to me, it's a fascinating subject. Uh, Brother Eric, what's your reaction? Do you think there's anything to what I just said that is striking to me that, they, that they're not lying? Uh, why aren't they making up some lie? Because they're telling the truth to, to, the, to uh, uh, 
of course, the way they said it, their, their account is, they really haven't done anything wrong. They're not really spies. And uh, they haven't really done anything wrong in terms of Egypt. Uh, they do have a guilty conscience about what they did with Joseph now. Uh, but they come back and give a completely true account of what happened to, uh, to Jacob. Absolutely. And uh, what uh, Bill and you just said uh, pretty much hit the heart of the matter uh, regarding this uh, study uh, of this time in Joseph's life. And it also reminded me of this scripture uh, that Moses spoke of when he said uh, a prophet will arise uh, and you will listen to him one like me that you will listen to him and of course he was talking about Jesus Christ and uh, I think it was Moses that said that okay I'm going to move on to the next verse now and just get uh, Jacob's reaction to this account uh, uh, let me see what verse was I on for a few. Uh, verse 35, I guess. And it came to pass as they emptied their sacks. I thought there was a reaction there. Am I missing a verse? Uh, okay. That's later on, yeah, towards the end, the reaction you'll see at the end. Okay. So verse 35, And it came to pass as they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both uh, they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you. For his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Well, uh, one thing that stuck out to me as I was reading it is it said that uh, uh, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. Well, he does have uh, ten, uh, uh, 10 other brothers, but I think that the distinction he's making is that Benjamin and Joseph are both brothers more so because they have the same mother, uh, uh, Rachel. And uh, the other brothers are all from Leah and from various uh, handmaidens. Uh, so this Benjamin and, and Joseph are, um, I see to me that uh, Jacob is making a distinction here that he's all alone. He doesn't have a real true true brother, uh, and so am I. Uh, think I'm reading too much into that, or no, no, that's the point. That, you know, Rachel was the one he loved. You know, these are his love children. So he had two children. From, from the one he loved, because we know that she died giving birth to it, so, you know, that, that was grief enough. And if he was to lose, you know, his only other son from the one whom he really loved, you know, that would literally take him to his grave. So, you know, your distinction's right. There is certainly a deep spiritual and emotional, you know, content there between, you know, th these two, you know, love children, these two sons from, from the one he loved. And what about the the position that he's taking now? One, he's not going to allow them to take Benjamin at this point. He's, he's absolutely against it, will not permit it. 
And Reuben swears that well, you can kill my two sons if I don't bring Benjamin back. Trust me, and I'll get him, get him back. But, and yet he, he's, at this point, uh, not permitting it. Well, yeah, yeah, at that point it doesn't. Well, so we, we've done it the next chapter, it all changes, but yeah, you know, it's interesting that that, that there's an offer of <laughs> two sons for two sons there, you know, and that, that, that was the, the way they done things in those days. All right, uh, shall we go on to chapter 43? Do you guys have time? My battery's about dead. Uh, my phone may die any second. Okay. Brother Bill, does time permit? Should we go on to chapter 43? I'll leave, I'll leave that up to you. I'll leave that up to you. Whether you want to go on to it today or, or leave it as, a, as a, a real grand finale next week, it's up to you. Because uh, I'd like to go ahead and go on as long as you guys, uh, time permits, uh, for you, Bill. And, and uh, stay with us as long as you can, uh, Brother Eric. So let's go to chapter 43, verse 1. And the famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had uh, brought out of Egypt. Their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, you shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Uh, if thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy these food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? <laughs> That's funny. I'm sorry. That strikes me as funny that they, he, he's upset that they divulged the fact that there was another brother. How are they supposed to know that he was going to make these kinds of demands? <laughs> yeah. It's just interesting now, you see, as time's progressed from you know, the last chapter where obviously he was adamant, you know, Benjamin was going to go down with him. But unfortunately, their position now where they're running out of food. And then hunger seemed to dictate, you know, what is going to happen next. And, and it's playing just perfectly. Well, I'm curious about uh, how much time has passed. Uh, is there any way that we can know? Well, I was thinking that because obviously it was only supposed to leave him in for a few days. But it seems they've eaten all the food. So unless they only got three days worth of food, you know, it just seems that they're probably left their brother and with Joseph even longer in the prison. Well, I'm just assuming that they, uh, they each of the brothers had uh, an animal and maybe a pack animal too, and they, and so you had maybe uh, ten brothers and and twenty animals that could carry grain, and that seems to me that would last quite a long time for uh, his family. But, uh, I think the the family and the the company or the camp, or the, the total population of, of Israel, uh, I don't know what it is at that time, but I think when they finally move there, as we see, we'll see it coming forward, that when they can't try to move to Egypt, that there's a quite a large uh, group. Uh, so if it's a large group that they're feeding, then it wouldn't last long at all. But it also strikes me as why would they even think that they can just keep on making this trip back and forth, bringing more food? Uh, it seems like they have to go and come and go many, many times uh, to uh, to accomplish it. Yeah, maybe that was their initial plan to keep going to and fro and to and fro, but as we know, it didn't work out that way, did it? What do you think of <laughs> Jacob's uh, continuing to be upset about? Now he's 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 adding another uh, 
charge against them that they're, you're stupid and you have, why did you have to even say that you have another brother? I mean, that to me is like a, I can understand him being upset and, 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 uh, and blaming them in that way, but really it's, it, who are, how are they to know that this guy, Joseph, is going to uh, say, well, you've got another brother. Well, you bring him to me. I mean, that would probably be the furthest thing from their mind. And yet Jacob is blaming them for even mentioning it. That's interesting. But it also shows, again, uh, how much, and, and rightly so, how much blame Jacob held towards, you know, his, you know, his sons in the initial, you know, missing of, you know, Joseph. You know, he's still holding that deep. And, you know, you can see that, can't you, just by the way he's talking to them. So he's still holding them accountable for losing, you know, Joseph all them years ago. And then, lo and behold, they want to, you know, there's a chance that Frog Benjamin's going to go missing, so he's still got a very a lot of, and I think rightly so, a bit of bitterness towards his other sons. So I think that is what's going on. There's a lot of family domestic issues going on there. I also noticed a lot of favoritism. Uh, uh, you know, we know that uh, uh, Ishmael was cast out because, and, and, uh, um, because, uh, uh, Isaac was the promised son, so they cast out Ishmael, and, and then we know that uh, Jake, uh, Esau was preferred by the father, by Abraham, and and, and uh, Jacob was preferred by uh, the, the mother. Um, and there just seems to be an awful lot of favoritism going on, and, and then we see that here with, with Jacob, uh, he has his favorite sons. And Joseph was clearly a favorite, and that's what really caused all the resentment in the beginning, showing this favoritism to Joseph. Um, and so it, it really is clearly uh, it's something that uh, I think is a flaw. I mean, even to me, if, if you have many children, even if in your heart you prefer one over another, it's not the kind of thing that you should uh, openly show so much because you're just going to cause more resentment and jealousy you know, within the family. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's why later on, you know, it's clear in the scripture that God is not respect for persons. So there's no favorites in that, in that sense with, with Jesus. And then the, the Apostle James, you know, you know, basically goes on how, that favoritism is forbidden. So now we know it's not God's heart. To have these little favourites, but yes, yeah, so, certainly a human flaw with <laughs> with Jacob. Okay, um, so um, we got uh, chapter forty-three now, uh, verse seven, and they said, "The man asked us straightly of our state." and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? <laughs> Have ye another brother? And we told him, according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones, uh, I will search, I will be surety for him, of my hand shalt thou require, if I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee, yet uh, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we be, we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. And their father Israel said unto them, if it must be so now to this, take our best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, and take double money in your hands and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure it was an oversight. Take also your brother and rise. Go again unto the man. So he he finally gives in 
because he really must. He doesn't really have any choice because they're, they're a little run out of food. And it stood out to me that they, they, even though there's a famine, that they still have these fruits and, and nuts and things. I, I, that never dawned on me before. Yeah, yeah, I've seen they've got like the delicate foods, but they haven't got their bulk food. Obviously, the wheat, the corn, and stuff like that, they haven't got their bulk food, you know, and I think, yeah, yeah, that's, I've not noticed that before, but you know, I can assume that's what it is because yeah, you can't just live on nuts and honey, you need to be a bit, not really a staple diet. And you knew it. And you're still mooted. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so he does finally concede. Uh, he really has no choice. Um, and I'll read on now to verse 15. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and, and Benjamin, and rose up, and went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home, and slay, and make ready, for these men shall dine me at noon. Dine with me at noon. Uh, maybe I read that wrong. It says, uh, bring these men home and slay and make ready. I guess he's just talking about slay an animal for food. Uh, I thought he was talking about slay them for a second and make ready. These men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, because of the money that was returned in our sacks at the first time, are we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our asses. <laughs> oh. Well, they sure are afraid. Why is it so natural for them to be afraid? Well, it certainly is natural for them because, like I said, there was a coup to spies, and then obviously there's still all that. <laughs> they, they didn't actually pay for the food, even though they did pay for the food, but it's all part of the clever ploy. But yeah, I'll be afraid as well. Okay. Uh, now, uh, and they came near to the steward of Joseph's house. And they communed with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks. And behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace be to you, fear not. Your God and the God of your father have given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money, and he brought Simeon out unto them. And the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their asses provender, and they made ready the present against Joseph uh, came at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him to the present, which was in the, their hand in the house, into the house, and bowed themselves to, the, to him, to the earth. And he asked them for their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom he spake, is he yet alive? Hmm. Does it strike you as... Uh, Curious, and you know, he's he's asking all these questions about the family and the father over and over again, wanting information about it. It seems to me that they they would be like, why does he want to know so much about our family? You know, why is our family so interesting to him? 
Well, yeah, he's chucking out them. That's all again part of the plan. He's chucking out massive hints, you know. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that his brothers were a little bit dense until this point. Then they start twigging on later, but you know, but he has been throwing out hints all along. But yeah, to me that would resound, you know. Why you keep asking about me dad? How do you know me dad? You know. But yeah, but it is all part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. I usually don't inquire about people's family unless I know the, the fam whole family. I mean, if I know someone and I don't know their parents, and their parents, the subject of their parents has is, is not been come up before, it's not natural for me to, to inquire about, well, how are your parents doing? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but it just not, doesn't seem like a normal thing, a uh, typical thing. Uh, and yet, he's doing it. And it seemed to me that they should start growing a little suspicious about why is he so interested in our father and and, and, uh, and the other brother. I mean, it, it doesn't seem it hasn't dawned on him yet to why he's so interested. Uh, Brother Eric, don't you have anything to any opinion about this? Yes, I. Uh... I would like to say something. Um, I'm surprised my phone hasn't died yet. It could, uh, I could uh, drop out at any second. So uh, let me just point out: in verse 23, is appears to me uh, a picture of the gospel, because you have the man bringing good news to uh, the brothers, where he says, "Peace be to you." That's that's the crucifixion. Fear not. That's the burial. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. That's the resurrection. And that's all good news. Well, I didn't say that one. That's a clever one. I didn't say that one come. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Thank you, brother. It's, uh... Uh, I would not have noticed that unless uh, unless you told me. So thanks. There's a uh, there's so much hidden in the scriptures, and, and that's why to those people watching this live or when it's uploaded as a video, I, I I hope that this will be like an encouragement to you to to know that if you were to uh, tell me what your favorite book is uh, that you've ever read. And uh, I know my, my wife, I asked her this question, what's your favorite book ever? She likes uh, uh, Old Man and Sea. And, uh, and I, I, I said, well, how many times have you read it? And she said, oh, I read it twice. I said, well, it's, it's unusual for a person to read a book twice. You know, usually you read it once. And that's enough, but because it's your favorite book, you read it twice. Uh, do, is there any reason for you to read it over again, over again every day? No, because the, even the greatest novels, the classics, after you've read them once or twice, you, you've got out of them pretty much what you're going to get out of them. There is no reason for you to continue reading it over and over again every day. But that's the difference between just the, 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 uh, all, all the other books of the world, and and, and this book here, this, this holy Bible, it's, it's 66 books, and, and uh, it's written on three different continents over a 1,500 year span by over 40 different authors from many different walks of life, uh, fishermen. Farmers, kings, uh, judges, historians, and and uh, this is the book that you can read every single day. Uh, I've been studying it pretty much daily for this December will be 29 years. It never gets old, and you never stop learning new things, and you never stop getting new insights like. Brother Eric just pointed out here. Um, you can read the same verse over and over again, and sometimes 
Now, if you've read it the 10th time or the 20th time or the 50th time, all of a sudden there's an epiphany. Either, either the Holy Spirit reveals something to me directly, or a brother, like Brother Eric, Brother Bill here, they'll share insights that I hadn't seen before. And it's exciting. Uh, I've never enjoyed learning things so much in my whole life. Of all of the subject matter I've ever studied in my life, there's a lot of studies I've found very interesting. But this is a study, this is a study of theology in this, the Bible that is, um, it never is completely satisfied. Like, okay, I've had enough. Brother Bill, before we go on to in this particular study, what's, what's your reaction to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, this is for you know, it, the Bible is described as quick, alive, as a living. It's not the, the paper and ink that, that are alive, but the author is alive and well. He's the creator of the universe. And, and you know, and you would you would agree with me in this that you know you could read the Bible and read a particular verse 20 times, and then all of a sudden that come the 21st time, something is revealed that you've never seen. And that is why it's alive. You know, God uses his word to reveal things all the time. And it is alive. It is, you know, it is living in that sense. And that's why you can't ever, it's not like any other book. You know, <laughs> authors live and die, and they pass on, but our author is still alive and our author lives inside us. You know, that's a remarkable book. Um. Brother, J Brother Jack Smack made a video yesterday uh, about the, the Holy Spirit, and, and one of the things he points he made in the video was that uh, it's through the Holy Spirit that we can understand the Scriptures, and um, it is it is true that the, the the Holy Spirit, when we put our faith in Jesus, that the Spirit of God comes and the first thing is we're, it says we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're uh, made a child of God where our spirit is brought to life and our spirit and the Holy Spirit are, are united and, and now we're a, a child of God. So we're baptized with the Holy Spirit and, and once that happens, we're indwelled. The Spirit lives inside us. And see if it's sealed means that the spirit will never leave us. So a person can never lose their salvation because the spirit can never leave us. That's the test. The scripture says the test of being a Christian is someone who has the Holy Spirit in them. So, so uh, we can never not be a Christian because we're sealed permanently with this Holy Spirit in us. And this Holy Spirit, as it says here in my shirt, brainwashed, Romans 12, 2, uh, be not conformed to this world. But um, be renewed, uh, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the Holy Spirit living in us transforms us over a lifetime. And the Holy Spirit living in us gives us insights and understandings in the scriptures that we couldn't have without the Holy Spirit in us. I'll move on, Brother Mushy, you want to make some comment on that. That's fine, yet carry on. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, verse 28. And this answered, Thy servant of our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. Uh, so, so here you have the... the the first time that you actually have the complete fulfillment of his original dream, you have all 11 of the brothers there bowing down and making obeisance to him, just as he said originally when he said these bundles of, of uh, wheat will bow down to him. Uh, and 29, and then he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom he spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. And Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, 
sit on bread. Oh, that's a very, very emotional, dramatic scene there, brother, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. We got us even to the point where he had to hold back his tears and then, you know, you know, hide into a chamber. You know, yeah, it's very emotional. Yeah. Um, you know, brother, I, I'm 64 now, and I remember uh, as a young man growing up that uh, my generation and the previous generations, my father and his father, we were always taught to not cry, and not be emotional. You know, we're men, and women are emotional, and men are not. And so I've always uh, behaved in that way. And I've noticed that over the last five years or so, especially, that I've become emotional. And it's a uh, it's kind of been hard for me in a way because it says he refrained himself in that verse. In other words, he suppressed his emotion. He held it back. And uh, I, I would always try to refrain my emotions. And uh, it got to the point, though, I don't know if it's normal for men to get older and maybe the chemistry of their body is changing and we tend to get more emotional, but for me, that's been my experience. And uh, I can imagine if I was in that kind of a situation where it would be so emotional. And uh, I've, I've actually had times where I've had to leave, go to another room or not. I can't even talk to someone for, for a moment because the emotions just overtake me. I don't know if you have these experiences here, a younger man than me, and maybe this happens when you get old. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, similar. I think a lot of it is, again, contextual, isn't it? You know, where you are, who you're with, what the situation is. But, yeah, most often, you know, I, I you know, storm off into a room or go somewhere else and then, you know, get myself... <coughs> You know, write again and come back out. But yeah, yeah it's, but it does depend on the scenario a lot of the time. So it isn't just an age thing because sometimes I have, you know, been emotional in front of the family, in front of people in a certain scenario. Yet another time, you know, I felt the need to to hide myself away, you know, put the you know the stiff up a bit on, <laughs> go you do your bet in your bedroom or whatever, <laughs> then come back out refreshed afterwards. So yeah scenarios and, and we can obviously see you know by reading what joseph done that there was a reason he had to do that because he was still you know the game was still being played the plan was still being panned out and if he would have suddenly broke down in front of him there and then that the plan wouldn't have been fulfilled so he had to do it in that situation yeah so the it says he refrained uh, or they're composed, and you know get, they say you, you should have composure. You get composed, and that's that's getting control of your emotion. But I, I I can really see how emotional this whole thing must be for Joseph. I mean, these the, the brothers, the only emotion that they're feeling is fear. <laughs> What's going to happen? And what if he decides that we're spies? What if he decides that we've stolen or something? So they have this emotional fear and, and, and just uh, dread of what might, might happen to them. And uh, but Joseph's emotions are uh, just... I think in there as well, what his point is that there is a picture again, as we see, uh, of Joseph being Christ and, you know, that his brothers being the lost sheep of Israel. You know, the, 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 the lost sheep of, of nothing but fear and, you know, overly fearful of God, where Christ was the opposite. He loved them and he wept for them and he had, you know, nothing but compassion on them. So there's a, there's a scenario there how, how they have wrongly seen the situation and, and how oftentimes Christians wrongly see the situation. Yeah, we see God as this ogre who is wrathful and angry with us 
but really all he's doing is composing himself but the yeah he, he weeps for us he loves us he cherishes us so there's a picture there that i see anyway yeah well i'm i'm real glad you're here with me to uh tie these loose ends together i mean because i i can see the these emotions but then i didn't take the next step and, and connect it to this uh picture of jesus that you're so doing so well uh i'm going to go on to the next verse you know uh, and they set on him, set on for him by himself, and and for them by themselves, uh, and for the Egyptians which did eat with him uh, by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Hmm, I did not know that. Uh, and they sat before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another, and he took and sent messes unto them <laughs> uh, from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. Hmm. Okay. So it looks like we're going to have the we're going to have the finale next week. Yeah, I think that it, it, we're going to have to do it next week. But uh, <coughs> there's a lot of interesting things happening in these last few verses here too, isn't there? Well, yeah, he's making it overtly that even on the table he's spoiling Benjamin. He had five times the amount of you know everyone else, but they all had enough. But and plenty, but obviously Benjamin have extra. Well, you muted that. Look. Uh, the the other thing is really so interesting, is it? And he sat on four by himself. Let me see. Uh, and, and, and verse thirty three. And and they and they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright. Oh, I misunderstood that. I thought that Joseph seated them in that order. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled at one another, one at another. Why would they marvel at that? I, I thought that Joseph had placed them in that order, and they were amazed by that. Yeah, yeah it's interesting, that. I think that's one going to have to be revealed to us another time. But yeah, I think that's probably got a point there. Let me look at that verse 33 in the Amplified and see if it tells us anything else here. Uh, 33. Uh, and Joseph's brothers were given seats before him. Okay. The eldest according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. So I think that this Amplified is, is stating it in the way that I always understood this. Uh, it says that they were given seats before him. In other words, they were seated in this order according to their birth. And uh, that's why they're so amazed. And the men looked at one another amazed that so much was known about them. So the Amplified does confirm my, uh, my thoughts on that. Yeah. 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 Well, it seems seems to me that uh, these brothers uh, they they got to be wondering. I guess they are at this point. They're finally amazed at how much he knows about them. So they're starting to really realize that something is uh, very strange going on here. And uh, of course, we know that in the next chapter, this is a dramatic head, and we'll do that next next week, I guess. Uh, but uh, anything else to be said about this before we uh, give an invitation for salvation? No, no, I think we've covered what we can cover on that, you know. And like I said, the the grand finale will be next week because it all, all you know 
fits into play, you know, fantastically. Yeah, it really does. Okay. All right. Well, brother, uh, you and I know that studying the scriptures is um, fascinating and very beneficial in, in so many ways. But there, there's one thing in the scriptures that is of utmost importance above everything else. And it would be negligent on our part uh, to, to do a study and then, and then not at least mention what is the most important thing that we find in this, in this entire book here. So that's all we want to do now. Uh, what good would it do for someone to study Proverbs and gain all kinds of wisdom or st study the other scriptures and learn all kinds of history about the history of Israel and the history of the world. And yet they missed out on the one thing that's most important, and that is uh, the question that I ask everybody. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? I found that if you ask that person to, let's say, a hundred strangers, you're, you're, you're going to find probably 95 out of 100 or more. They're going to answer the question incorrectly. They're going to say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven, but if I go to heaven, it's because I'm a good person. And I'm, I'm trying to follow the commandments and I'm trying to follow the golden rule and I go to church and I do this and I do that. They think that they're going to go to heaven if they can just be good enough and, and please God that he'll accept them. And that's the biggest error and lie uh, that we see in the world today. So we want to tell the people the correct answer to that question. Brother Bill, might, let me ask you, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Yes, I'm going to go to heaven. I know that for a fact, not because of anything that I've done, but because of what the author of that very book that we've been speaking of today has done for me. That is the only reason I'm going to heaven. And like I said, if you want me to expand on that, then I will do so. But basically what you need to know is you need to get to know the author of that book. Right? It's a person. You know, it's not uh, some kind of fictitious person or... or, or uh, some kind of unknown spiritual force now this is a real person all right and this real person whose name is jesus christ now, he is god manifest in the flesh and as we've just read we've seen you know some shadows of this creator which is jesus christ even within what we've been reading about joseph you know joseph in in a sense was a picture of being someone who's perfect, you know, who's blameless, who's done no wrong, yet he suffered greatly. But he suffered greatly for a reason that his family could be saved from famine. And the same picture can be put on Christ. He was innocent, he was perfect, but he suffered. Not to stay, you know, save us from a physical famine, but to save us from, from spiritual starvation so that we could become alive, be quickened and made alive in him. And, and there's, there's so many different pictures we see we've got we just read of between Joseph and Christ. But what is essential is that is to know this this Jesus Christ is alive. He's a real person. He is God manifesting in flesh, and He desires this day that you, you be saved. And you may say, you know, what do I need saving from? You need saving from sin. You need to be back to God again. You know, sin is just means to miss the mark. God is holy and perfect. You know, God is there. And on our best day, we can reach there. That's imperfect. We can never get to heaven by being good, as Brother Luke just said. You know, we're not going to get to heaven by, you know, paying taxes, being generous to, to poor people. Although that's good, that's not going to get us to heaven. The only way we're going to get to heaven is to be perfect like God. And the only way we can become perfect like God is to believe on Christ. Because Christ was perfect and he died, you know, for the sole reason that we may live. You know, it's called imputation. If you, you know, all our wrongs, all our fallen shorts were, were placed on Christ at Calvary. 
and exchange for that, we got all Christ's perfectness, all his righteousness, all his goodness, so we could meet the very same bar that God expects so we can receive eternal life and go to heaven. You know, and, and this is the Christ you need to believe in. There's many a false Christ out there, but you know, the real one loves you dearly this day. The real one chose, you know, freely out of his love and mercy to, to die for you today, to make a payment for all your wrongs so that you can receive the free gift of eternal life. If you believe on this Jesus Christ, who loved you and died for you and made payment for your sins, who was buried and rose again victorious the third day in resurrection power, which is proof that, you know, if, if God can raise himself from the dead, that same God will dwell in you if you believe on him and he will raise you from the dead. So you receive your full, you know, spiritual healing that day. You won't starve spiritually. You know, you will live forever and you, you will never go without. You'll never be with, you know, in lack. You know, so I would encourage anyone to listen to this, you know, to watch it from the beginning. You know, even have a Bible with you. Even if you're, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You know, you don't have to be a Christian to have a Bible. Just, you know, get a Bible, go online. Read what we've read today in Genesis and see if you, you know, see that a picture between Joseph and Jesus. You know, and, and just, just come to him, accept him as, as a loving saviour that he is. And, and it isn't complicated. You know, religion, he would make it very complicated. You would have to go through hoops and do somersaults and do all manner of things that, that you don't need to. And that, that would actually make no and void a relationship with the living God. Because that's all he desires. Just simple faith, simple trust. He wants the relationship with you. And to have a relationship, you need to know him personally. You don't need to know the you know, facts and figures about this person. You need to know him as a person. And there's a beautiful, and, and I'll bring us up every time, and I will never get bored of bringing this up, that, that the perfect scenario in the Bible, in the book of Acts, you know, there, there was a Philippine jailer, and he had the Apostle Paul and Silas, and, and other people in a prison. And there, there was an earthquake. And the earth chains fell off the prisoners. And under Roman law, you're set with the scenario we're, 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 I'm showing you now. So the prison shook, the chains fell off, and, and, and the prison guard assumed they're all going to flee. So he, was, he got a sword and he was just about to give himself. You know, and Paul and Silas, you know, told him not to, basically. No, don't do that. Don't do that. We're all here. Look, no one's escaped. No one's fleeing. We're all here. All right. And then he says, and then, you know, this is the most poignant things that, and most profound thing that a believer, a non believer has said. So simple, so poignant, and so straight to the point. And he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not what could I do to be saved, or should he said, What must I do? Brass tax here, what must I do to be saved? And they simply said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple this day. So if you're there and, and, and you're, you know, thinking, you know, am I going to get to heaven? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Can I get to know this Jesus? The simple answer is yes. Just clearly, you know, what must I do to be saved? And the answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ this day. Believe that he loves you so much that he died to pay for all your sins, that he was buried and he did rise again in resurrection power. If you believe them facts now in whom they are wrought, which is Jesus Christ, you will be saved and you will be guaranteed a place in heaven. Because we know that God cannot lie. The word says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, which is to change his mind. And throughout scriptures in the New Testament, you know, God has promised eternal life to those who believe in him. So, you know, it's a cast iron guarantee. Put your trace and put your faith in this Jesus Christ and become a son of God forever and have this relationship with a living God. And also you'll be my brother or sister, which is also a bonus. And Luke will like that also. So I'll leave you with that. Trust Christ this day and be saved and ever secure. God bless. Right. Thank you, Brother Bill. And you certainly did pass my test when I asked you the question, uh, do you believe you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Uh, that, be, before you explained all the reasons why you're, what you're basing your answer upon, your answer simply was, yes, I know I'm going to go to heaven. 
because God promised it to me. God doesn't lie. I know I'm going to go to heaven, and it's not because of anything I've done. It's not because of how good I am. I don't deserve it at all. It's only because of what Jesus has done for me. He became a man, he died for my sins, and he rose from the dead so he could give me life everlasting. And it's only, so they say, what's your plea? Why should I let you into heaven? Don't ever plea, well, I, I did this or I did that. Don't, don't plead your case based on yourself. Plead your case the way Brother Bill did and said, it's nothing, it's not about me. It's only about Jesus. I'm trusting him to give me a place in heaven. All right, thank you for joining me, Brother Bill, and uh, uh, viewers, uh, I, I do these uh, broadcasts every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, so uh, join us Wednesdays and Sundays, and uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.